Thank you very much, Francine, and thank you for you know, inviting us to, uh, uh, in this great house, uh, the French house uh, of NYU, to uh, uh, have this, uh, this evening uh, devoted to uh, Juno in English. Uh, I will present Alison and Paul, uh, and then they will do the most of the talking. <laughs> <laughs> Alison Waters has specialized in the translation of modern and contemporary French and Francophone literary fiction. Uh, she has translated many authors, among whom Vassilis Alexakis, Louis Aragon, Emmanuel Bov, Albert Kosri, Hubert Haddad, and Daniel Pénac. She has been awarded several grants and prizes for her translations, including in 2012, the Florence School French-American Translation Prize for her translation of Éric Chevillard's Prehistoric Times. Her current projects include translating the work of prize-winning children's author Claude Ponty, Elsewhere Editions, and two books by the godfather and wizard of Polar, Jean-Patrick Manchette, for New York Review Books. Her translation of Jean Giono's A King uh, Without Diversion is slated to appear with New York Review Books late next year. She teaches literary translation workshops at Yale University and is the managing editor of Yale French Studies. Paul April studied English literature and medieval history at the University of Toronto. After a career in book publishing, he moved to an orchard on the Niagara Escarpment, where he edited book manuscripts, wrote poetry, and began to translate from French to English. His first translation, Jean Giono's Hill, Colline, was published by New York Review Books in 2016. Giono's Melville, a novel, Pour saluer Melville, has just appeared. And by the way, the books are for sale uh, if you want to buy some. Uh, after the, uh, the discussion we'll, we'll have, has just appeared. April is now working on a third Giono no novel, also to be published by New York Review Books, The Open Road, Les Grands Chemins. <clears throat> uh, so, I mean, welcome our, again, our guests tonight. Uh, I would like to start with uh, asking Paul about uh, you know in English, what has been translated, what has not been translated, uh, when, where, <laughs> briefly. <laughs> Thank you. Is no. no. No? No? Yes. No? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Thank you, Emmanuel, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, I'm not going to give an exhaustive answer to the question. It would take a long time. It's actually a very complicated question because uh, Jonah went through many different periods. Um, but um, when he burst onto the literary scene in Paris in 1929 with his first novel, Colleen, um, it was Im almost immediately translated into English by a Frenchman named Jacques Leclerc, who was living in New York at the time and um, uh, directly involved in what was then the Brentano's publishing house. I think you're all familiar with Brent, the name Brentano's. They um, uh, were one of the leading booksellers in New York until fairly recently. Um, unfortunately, their publishing wing failed in the mid-1930s, so that translation, which was entitled, um, strangely, uh, Hill of Destiny, <laughs> um, uh, went out of print and had been out of print for many decades by the time I came to retranslate it. Uh, Leclerc went on almost uh, right away to translate Jono's second novel in his Trilogie de Pain, um, Un de Beaumigne, um, it also appeared here in the United States, and uh, again, the third um, uh, volume in the trilogy, Regain, was um, published in English in the U.S., um, and to great acclaim. Um, indeed, um, during Giono's whole first major period, which the French critics usually call his première manière, um, these were books, uh, highly lyrical books, influenced largely by Greek and Latin classical literature, and in Jono's case, uh, very much by um, Whitman, whom he adored. Um, it's remarkable that Jono taught himself English. I don't know how many of you know his biography, but um, he had the equivalent of a high school education, 
and had to leave at the age of 16 to work in a bank, but was a voracious reader and, uh, and did master English to the point where he could appreciate Whitman and eventually, indeed, to translate Moby Dick, but I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> um, so um, all of those early books uh, that um, gained Jeannot a great deal of fame in France um, uh, were also well received in the US. And so I think it's fair to say that Jono had a higher profile and more celebrity and was more, more appreciated at that time than he has been ever since. Um, of course, he continued to write. Um, he had a lot of trials and tribulations. I don't want to get into those. It's a rather thorny subject. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, his later books um, were mostly translated over the years. Um, he turned from being a writer who focused mostly on nature um, and in that very lyrical vein to writing works that were more influenced by Balzac and Stendhal, um, more ambitious historical kinds of books. Um, and there, particularly the Usar cycle, um, which included Le Usar sur le toit, which was made into a, quite a successful feature film in the 90s. Um, but there is an irony in all of this, and that is that um, in, in the 1950s, in 1953 specifically, uh, Reader's Digest magazine um, was commissioning pieces from writers all over the world on the topic of the most interesting person I have ever met. And they approached Jono, uh, little knowing, I think, his, his devious cast of mind. <laughs> and Jono accepted and quickly wrote a piece um, that he called L'homme qui plante des arbres. Um, he submitted it. Uh, Reader's Digest happily accepted it initially. But after a short time, uh, they came back to him with another letter saying that they were rejecting his piece because it was false. They had actually sent an, in, an inspector from their Paris office down to Provence to investigate whether or not this character whom Giono had invented and called Elzear Bouffier really existed. They even went to the, to, the, you know, to the municipal office in this town of Banon and you know, to find the death certificate for this guy. It didn't exist. So Reader's Digest was indignant and they rejected, <laughs> they rejected Jono's piece. But meanwhile, and, and this, the history of this is lost, but somehow the, um, the manuscript made its way over to Vogue magazine. Vogue published it in English. It was published in English for the first time, never in French at that, at that point. Um, and gradually, it became better and better known. Um, in the 1960s, uh, an organization that was international but had an American branch called Friends of the Earth, um, or I should say Friends of Nature, issued it with an introduction by a, a, a senator. Um, so it started to get a lot of circulation. And by the 1970s, it had become a kind of international, inspirational, ecological fable. Eventually picked up by Chelsea Green publishers, who are a very, very large um, and environment and nature publisher. And if you go on the Chelsea Green website and look for the man who planted trees, they state to this day that there are over a quarter of a million copies of this book by Jono in print, which is astounding. I mean, that is a bestseller of dimensions that are, you know, almost untold. Um, so, so, I mean, that, a bit of a, I think it's an interesting story, but all by way of saying that most people, I would say, you know, in, in the English-speaking world, have not really heard of Jean Giono. But large numbers have actually read him without realizing that it was Jean Giono. So we can only hope that this resurgence in interest, and especially the support that's being given by New York Review Books with the issuing of two so far that I have translated with Allison's forthcoming and then another one by myself and who knows after that, that this is going to revive appreciation for Giono, raise his profile, and enable English speakers uh, to, to appreciate one of the greatest French writers of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's a, a fascinating story, really, indeed.
I just have a quick question for Paul. Do we did we ever know who translated the man who planted trees? No, no right? we don't. Yeah, no, I, I actually thought. asked my friend Edmund White, who is here this evening. I'm very pleased to say because Edmund actually worked with Vogue for many years. If there was any way to sort of get through to someone there who might have access to their archives, but I don't know if they would even know. It's, it's just been effaced, and and this for a change. <laughs> yes, and I think this this is one of the reasons why. Uh, I mean, Giono had renounced uh, all of his royalties from the get-go in this, n never realizing how, how big a success it would become. Uh, but it, it, it gradually became less and less equitable for his heirs and his estate. And I, I'm happy to say that I believe in the last decade, some steps were taken to enable um, his estate to receive a certain amount of, of revenue from that, and that the translator's title. estate as well, we hope. <laughs> yes, I should make, Thank you, Alison. Indeed, no, no, it's really a travesty. Uh, and they keep bringing it up, and they, they've got introductions by named authors, but, but the, the translate. There are other translations that have been published by named translators, but the one that Chelsea Green continues to issue does not. Thank you so much. Um, Alison, I'm going to ask you my next question, and uh, it's a very general question. I would like you to uh, tell us about, you know, broadly the challenges that uh, you had to face with uh, translating Un Roi Sans Divertissement, and, uh, and then after, <clears throat> after that, maybe uh, take a closer look at some passages and, and tell us about how you managed to translate them. Well, I'm, I'm in a more privileged position, in a sense, than Paul. Can, is, my, is my mic on? because my book isn't out yet, and it's not even been copy edited yet. So if you guys have any feedback you can give me, I'll be happy to take it. Uh, <laughs> it's like a workshop. Um, there are so many difficulties in this text. When I went to Manosque, thanks to Paul, actually, and um, met Jacques Meigny, the what is he, the president of the Giono, uh, the Giono Association, very lovely, generous man, um, spent lots of time with me explaining things, but one thing that he was absolutely thrilled about was that I was going to tackle this book because no one had wanted to tackle it before. Um, I'm known for tackling books that other people have said are untranslatable, and this one is not untranslatable, um, but it's, it was pretty close. Um, one of the major difficulties of it is that there are several narrators there are several pers first-person narrators. Some of them are omniscient. Some of them are characters who are speaking for long periods of time. There's the old people of the village who are somewhat like a chorus. Um, and then there is the author who steps in every now and then who puts in parentheses, I wanted to say that, and I did, um, and does things like that. Um, so one of the difficulties for me was figuring out who was speaking. Um, and it's, it's not easy, because there aren't always indications of, of who is speaking. So it takes a while, and of course that changes the way that you translate according to who's speaking, especially when you have this chorus speaking of old men, um, recounting things that they probably couldn't really have known either um, to this narrator who comes in. So the events of the story take place in... 1843, 1845, 1846, and then 20 years later, and then the time of the writing is 1946. Giraudot wrote the book in, I think, less than 10 months. It took me more than two years to translate it. So um, that's also, there are also problematic things that you can feel um, were rushed. I've asked many French speakers, including my dear friend and translator Emmanuel Hertel, um, about things that I had no idea. And she said, I think he just wrote that in a hurry. And I'm like, OK, I feel much better because I really don't get this. Um, I have to also give a nod to my good friend, Donald Nicholson Smith, who is in the audience and a wonderful translator and has, for the past 10 years, been my eyes and my ears for helping go through every, every problem that I've ever had. And whether we've solved them or not, we've always had lot of good martinis together and <laughs> felt that we got somewhere. So thank you, Donald, and thank you, Emmanuel, and thank you, Paul. They've all been involved in this in, in one way or another. So one of the problems is not knowing who's speaking. One of the problems is sometimes they're speaking with this Provençal dialect, 
um, not so much in this book, but, but enough. Um, and then the tenses. The tenses were a real problem. And you'll hear in some of the passages that I'm going to read, um, Gino switches from past to present to future um, according to who's speaking and according to where this narrator decides he is in the story. So at one point he says, what's happening to me? What am I doing? And we don't know who that I is, but it is the author narrator. So he comes and he goes and he takes on the tenses from the 1840s and then he takes on tenses from the 1940s and then he takes on tenses from the 1880s near the end of what's happening. And so at first I was really confused and then I just said, I'm going to stick to his tenses because they're really important for everything and I wrote to Edwin um, Frank at New York Review and I said, whoever's going to edit this, please don't have them touch the tenses <laughs> until I've had a chance to look at them. You can question anything you want, but do not touch those tenses because I've killed myself over them. So those were the problems in addition to, Gilles has a vocabulary, and I'm sure Paul has seen this too, that, I mean, I'm a pretty good speaker of English and a pretty good speaker of French, but his vocabulary is you can only call it foissonnant. I don't even know the word in English for that. There is so much, especially in the, in the lyrical passages um, and all the stones that I had to look up and all the trees that I had to look up and all the flowers and all the, and all the furniture. I mean, there's passages of furniture, and I'm like, oh, please, you know. So, so it was hours and hours of, but, you know, it's not just to say that Jill No does this. Any book that we do, we have to spend hours and hours researching um, but this really, I mean, wrote it in 10 months and it took me two years to translate it and I'm still, it, it's, it's amazing. And I mean, this is my 17th book and I, I have to say, I think it, with Chevillard, um, who's very weird, um, but this was definitely the most difficult book that I've tackled um, and I really hope that I've done it somewhat justice and if I haven't, it's not in print yet so you can all help me. <laughs> Um, did, that, so, did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, it did. So do you want to uh, take a closer look at some passages? And I would, I would love to, yeah. <laughs> um, so you, have, you just have the French in front of you. I didn't give you the English. And it, really, it's not that long. I just had to print it really big so I could see it. Uh, There's one more. One more. <laughs> Otherwise, if people can share. Oh, you have? So my passages are from uh, Roi Sans Divertissement, and they're in French, and I've numbered them one, two, and three. Yeah, no, oh, I want to I wanna read the English. Do you want to read the French? Mm, I don't think so. I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe we'll read one of them in French, um, but I'm going to read them in English, and you have the French to, to follow along. Um, and I've, I've just... There are three short, relatively short passages. They come from different sections of the book. And what I've tried to do, since the book is so complex, there's no way in three short passages you can get a summary, an idea. Um, but what I've tried to do is just show the different kinds of uh, writing that, that Gilno has. So the, the first passage that I've chosen comes from, on, on, if you have the French, pages 38 and 39. Um, and I've just titled this arbitrarily because there's so much else going on here, but descriptions of nature. And, and Paul will have tons of these. Did you? Oh, yes, no, but I'm wondering, are, were they the first part of the printout or the second part of the printout? It's a back at the printout? Yeah. Okay, 39, okay. So this is from Un Roi Sans Divertissement. Um, and the title, which I've translated as a king without diversion, comes from Pascal's Pensée. And I took the title that was one of the titles. It's the, these pensées have been translated many times, but this was the title that, that I preferred. So I st stuck with that as the title of the novel. <clears throat> the Sawmill Beach had not yet reached, of course, the magnitude it has today. But its youth, well, at least in relation to now, or more accurately, its adolescence, 
was of a stature and fabric that placed it head and shoulders above all the other trees, even all the other trees combined. Its foliage was thick, bushy, and as dense as stone, and its frame, none of which could be seen, so covered was it with small branches, each more impenetrable than the next, must have been of a rare strength and beauty to bear so much accumulated weight with such grace. It was especially, at the time, filled to the brim with birds and flies. It had as many birds and flies as leaves. It was constantly being plowed into and shaken by crows and rooks and swarms. At every moment, it released splashes of nightingales and titmouses and vapors of wagtails and bees. It breathed falcons and gadflies. It juggled with multi-hued balls of finches, goldcrests, robins, plovers, and wasps. All around it was an endless dance of birds, butterflies, and bugs, in which the sun seemed to break up into rainbows through bursts of sea spray. And in autumn, with its long crimson strands, its thousands, thousand arms entwined with green serpents, its 100,000 hands of golden foliage playing with feathered pom-poms, strings of birds, and crystal dust. It was no longer really a tree. The forests, seated on the mountain terraces, ended up staring at it in silence. It crackled like an inferno. It danced like only supernatural beings know how to dance, proliferating its body around its immobility. It swayed around itself in a twisting of scarves, so quivering, so bronze, so indefatigably remolded by the euphoria of its body that one could no longer tell if it was anchored by the clinging of its prodigious roots or by the miraculous speed of the tip of the spinning top on which the gods take their rest. The forest, sitting on the bleachers of the mountain amphitheater in their grand priestly vestments, no longer dared to move. That masterful beauty was as hypnotizing as the eye of a snake or the blood of wild geese on snow. And all along the roads that went up to or came down from that beauty, a procession of maples stained with blood like butchers fell in line. <laughs> that's, that's you know, that's, that's not me. Um, so the, um, the blood, blood is a very important light motif through all this, and blood on snow especially. Um, so that comes back throughout the whole book. And I don't want to give a spoiler about what happens in the end, but um, blood on snow, that's all I'm going to say. Um, okay, then um, briefly, I just... Um, pulled out something that I'm calling character descriptions. There are so many characters, I can't even begin. I, I think they, somebody published a list of them. I think there are like 75 characters in this book. Um, but I'm just going to read um, two that go together, a husband and wife. Um, the man is called to the village because they have wolves that are destroying the, um, the, the sheep and the cows and the cattle and, and whatever. And... Um, he has become, he's the captain of what's called the Louvterry, which is the wolf hunting corps. And he comes to the village with his wife. And so this is the description. He was not an influential voter. One couldn't call him a romantic lord of the manor either. As a matter of fact, romantic was just a bit of an understatement. He was a Guadalajara, as we call people here who had gone to Mexico to make a fortune. He had come back full of pesos, no doubt about it, but he had lost a couple of marbles in the process. Physically speaking, he was a small man, no taller than a grasshopper's knee, well proportioned in his trimness, so much so that you would have thought he was a young lad if it weren't for his patch of gray goatee and the most extraordinary pattern of wrinkles ever worn on yellowing skin. Was he lively? Yes, indeed. Despite his 60 years, he was made of a kind of powder that caused him to explode at every opportunity and that propelled him so powerfully into dust particles that there, in front of you, where he had been a moment ago, nothing remained. He would patch himself together piece by piece, ready for another takeoff a la Jules Verne while you were rubbing your eyes. His wife was a Creole woman older than he was, still beautiful and languid like a late afternoon in June. 
At first, people here took her to be uncivilized, but she wasn't, not at all. She had come, so it was said, from a very sp famous Spanish convent that provided an education to all the daughters from good families in Mexico, in an odd spot for young girls, so it was said, near a volcano and a glacier. But about those things from another world, you know, we said a lot of rubbish. But I do know that when Madame, Madame Timote, we called her Madame Tim, came to the area, she was approaching 60, she looked 20, well, let's say 30. She was much talked about. Just imagine this woman of cerulean marble with eyes that took forever to blink, like the sun setting. That's when the rumor about the convent near the volcano began, I'm sure of it. Before that, I think people had only spoken about snow. I even think it was Madame Tim in person who deliberately spread the rumor. Tell them, she said, that it is very high, very high, higher than here. And just to hear her pronounce those very high, very high, higher, with a supple and slow rumbling from her throat, similar to the secret call of yous, one would have spread whatever rumor she wanted. <laughs> now, what's confusing here, and still to me, I, who the hell knows who I is and who we are in this passage? Uh, I don't know. Um, maybe you'll figure it out. Okay, and this is the last one. Um, I hope you'll bear with me. Um, I find this passage, and there are so many, there's so much humor, so much tenderness towards his characters, um, and so much beauty in his descriptions. And so since I did a nature description, I'm going to do description of interiors and humor. Um, and here we have three people. We have Madame Tim, whom you've already met. We have Sausage, who is one of the main characters and is, who is often the narrating eye. And then we have the royal prosecutor. And they are all, <clears throat> let us say, very big, very big, very big. <laughs> um, so this is now um, Sausage speaking. And this is 200 to 202. We went back through the salon. As we were re-entering the vestibule to pass to the other wing of the chateau, judging from the direction that Madame Tim was pulling me in, Someone coughed discreetly behind us. It was the prosecutor. He was like a bloated balloon, enormous and very light, set on the tip of the wind. His anxious eyes wondered which way that wind was blowing. Come, Madame Tim said to him. We let go of each other, and he placed himself between the two of us, Madame Tim on his right arm and I on his left. He was as tall as we were and two times as fat, but he walked at our pace. And this is how we entered the large dining room. The table was set for the evening meal. The four big French doors, filled with that ashen afternoon, lit the long table that was gleaming with crystal. Organized around the ceremonial decanters with their lovely mass of purple wine was an aquatic rippling of a whole host of perfect luxury cutlery, milky pools of porcelain, and the twinkling of a thousand tiny arcs of broken rainbows that burst from the cut crystal, the beveled edges, and the limpidity of the entire water lily of glassware. We walked around the table very seriously, all three of us together, side by side. The stomach that the prosecutor shoved out of the way with a thrust of his thigh at each step added gravitas to our stroll. First, we passed through the French doors as if through two front battle lines, with on one side the terraces covered by the ashen sun, lawns, yew trees shaped like a chessboard, and balustrades, and beyond all that, the unfurling of more than 100 leagues of mountains of pearls sitting atop vast carpets of rosy wheat, and on the other side, that miraculous lagoon of the long table with its crystallized waters. We turned at the far end and walked back in step, moving along the other side of the table and inspecting the whole series of large and small Venetian mirrors where thousands of tiny reflections of our three serious selves were framed as we passed the one big reflection of our three serious selves. And I said to myself, we'll see about that. When we returned to the vestibule, we climbed up the staircase in unison. The stairs were low, marble, and very easy to climb. Our fat bodies rose one step at a time, and I said to myself, 
Heave ho, heave ho, how far up are you going to have us go? All the way until we found the one who has the cure? We were so enormous that the huge landing of the second floor on which the collection of antique instruments was housed began to tremble as we approached its old guitars and old pianos. And when all three of us stepped together on the landing, hauling our three fat bodies in a final effort, those wild drums that Madame Tim had brought from her country and hung on the walls began to dully beat some sort of somber call to arms. We were really very imposing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. That was uh, beautiful. Um, well, I'll basically, Paul, ask you the same question that I asked uh, Alison. I'm very lazy tonight. Uh, <laughs> um, could you tell us about the main challenges that you had to face with translating uh, Melville? Uh, and pour saluer Melville? And um, maybe we can look at a passage and take a closer look at a passage. Oh yes, of course. Um, but first I actually want to respond to something that Alison pointed to and, and reinforce it because um, when I started with Colleen, uh, I faced this, this issue, this perplexing issue of tense shifting. It was maddening, I mean, as a translator. It's, it's hard enough when you're just reading a book like that for pleasure, right. but when you're trying to render it in a way that would be comprehensible to someone in another language, you really um, are you know, forced to, to come to grips with it and try, in a sense, to, to rationalize it a little bit. But eventually I realized, and I, I'm quite sure of this, um, it's a theory, but I, I would defend it, that, <laughs> that, that the reason Jono was doing this from the get-go is that he was steeped in oral culture. That's where he started storytelling. And, it, and, and I think we're all familiar with this, that when you go to tell a story about something that has happened in the past, you begin in the past tense, but then you very naturally and unconsciously slide into the present tense as you're reenacting the narrative. And Jono, as a kind of untutored writer, at that stage, I mean, when he wrote Colleen, didn't uh, attempt to, in a sense, correct that. He just let it go that way. Mm -hmm. And his editors wisely didn't try to fix it either. Right. And that's part of what gives it its immediacy. So I think that, uh, uh, that in the end, I made the same decision that you did, Alison. I said, no, I'm just going to more or less leave it the way it is. And thankfully, my editor respected that too. <laughs> um, now, when it came to Melville, there was a, a whole other suite of issues um, that had to do not just with tense shifting, but also with shiftings of narrative voice and point of view. Because the, the, the premise of this book, uh, Pour Saluer Melville, is that um, uh, Jono set out to write a preface to the translation of Moby Dick that he had done with another Frenchman named Lucien Jacques. Um, and uh, he, the publisher, Gallimard, um, gave him quite a bit of latitude. So Giono, um, always being ready to launch off into confabulation, um, began by writing a sort of potted biography of Melville with the few sources that were available to him at that time in, in 1940. But all of a sudden, turns Melville into a fictional character uh, who goes off on a fictitious voyage to England and has a fictitious romantic uh, encounter with a fictitious uh, Englishwoman who's involved um, with the um, Irish uh, <laughs> revolutionary movement. And, um, but at the same time, Jono uses this Melville character as a proxy for himself, as a writer, as an artist, and he explores all kinds of issues around creativity, around fame. Um, Jono was at the point in his own career where he had become very famous writing the kinds of books that we talked about earlier that were uh, concerned with nature and with the return to the land and all that thing which he himself started to call Faire du Jono. <laughs> um, and that he was tired of that, so he has his character of Melville 
meditate on these issues, express frustrations about these issues, and in the course of a single sentence, he will switch from the first to the third person and back again. And so, you know, I think anyone could imagine what a challenge that poses. And again, I think the right decision was more or less to let it stand. Um, you know, that's the nature of the art. You don't want to go messing around with it, and it gives it its unique character. So I think those were the biggest uh, issues I faced. Um, the, the passage that I've selected to read um, doesn't really include those issues. It's a more straightforward <laughs> narrative bit, but I just thought that, I, um, I, that it, it interested me because it, it posed a challenge in terms of um, achieving um, uh, an appropriate um, equivalent in English to the um, narrative energy uh, that Giono genera gen generated in French. And um, there were some images that were quite problematic for me um, that worked, made sense in French, but didn't seem to make much sense in English, and that I had to, you know, where I had to resort to taking a liberty um, to, to have it make, make sense. So, I will. What uh, if you wish, if, if anyone wants. Oh, okay. Uh, well, it's it's just I'm, I think it was part of the printout. No, uh, it starts by uh, page uh, eighty-three, uh, top of the page. Uh, Il n'y avait personne autour de la malle de Bristol. Oh yes. So le cocher, uh, le postier. I, I thought I might have made arrows on the on the page where it begins. Can you find it? No. I only have the French. I only have no the arrows. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, so it's okay. top of page eighty-three. Il n'y avait personne autour de la malle de Bristol. Is everyone there? Yeah? Okay. We don't have it. Maybe. Okay. Oh, I should give a little bit of setup to the this, this, this scene. Um, so, um, Giono has gotten uh, Melville over to England, and Melville has become sick of London and decides to get out of town and he wants to go off on a jaunt to the West Country. And so he decides to take the Bristol Mail, which was a famous coach that ran out towards, um, towards the West. And so this is when uh, Melville approaches the, um, the yard where the, where the mail coach is being prepared for the journey, early morning. There was no one around the Bristol Mail except for the coachman and the postillion who were strapping down a chest and two leather bags between the rear springs. The curtains of the coupé were drawn. Herman climbed onto the top deck. After leaving London on the Eaton Road, right away the four horses broke into full gallop. The meadowlands were covered with frost. It was only through thousands of iridescent scintillations, like peacock feathers, that you saw the dense greenery of the grasses. Huge groves of sycamores loomed out from the blueness of the mist. They advanced, rearing massive limbs, shrank away from the road and the coach, and retreated across the fields. The coachman's whip tore shreds of smoke from the trees, and the horse's steam flowed and rolled onto the shoulders of the road. The two lead horses galloped, heads down, straining at the bit, legs rounded as though they were rolling up balls of wool. The two wheel horses, noses in the air, shook their manes and whinnied. The sun was already up when they encountered the first Tilbury on its way to London. They saw it turning into the high road from a dirt track. The driver was a short, dark-haired man, very erect, in a tight-fitting jacket and a hunting scarf, which you could see from 30 yards away, wound three times around his scrawny neck. He was endeavoring to get his horse to break into a gallop without compromising his own upright bearing or his poise. He passed at full speed alongside the carriage. The postillion slapped his thighs in appreciation. The coachman took the opportunity to pass him the reins and warm his own hands by banging them together inside his thick mittens. Then he took hold of the reins again and promptly let the team know he was back in charge. It was becoming clear that the countryside had awakened before London. They encountered the first market-bound cart. 
It was sticking to the middle of the road, a wide, slow vehicle drawn by three horses in tandem. The postillion grabbed hold of his hunting horn and started demanding room to pass, bawling at the cart with long fanfares. Finally, as they were bearing down on top of the cart at full gallop, he stood up on his seat. Leaning forward, he puffed his cheeks out big enough to make his eyes pop. The farmers leapt down to grab onto the bit of their lead horse, and the whole rig pulled slowly off into the field on the left at the very moment when the mail coach passed without slowing, heeling over to the right. The coachman remained motionless in his thick, fur-lined mantle, his mittens, and the prodigious layer of red fat that padded his hide. All he did was blow steam out past his whiskers. The postillion bemoaned the insufferable task to which he was obliged to devote his earthly existence he proclaimed it to the entire world, including Herman, in words made inaudible by the rumbling of the iron wheels. But then they encountered the rest of the carts. They saw a whole line of them accompanied by people on foot. So the postillion, hanging on to the guardrails of the top deck, began blasting on his horn as though it was the very ram's horn of rage and despair. The astonishing, out-of-breath death rattle of his bellowings made dense flights of larks rise from the most distant fields. And as though it had been hit broadside by an insurmountable wave, the male, almost touching the near bank, flew by the carts at full gallop, straightened itself out on the open road, and continued to race forward, still swaying on its springs, gradually regaining its equilibrium while little by little, the steam puffing out through the coachman's whiskers stopped. At Paddington, they picked up a bag of mail. The burrow was coming to life, stretching itself, making squeaking noises from all its storefronts. On his doorstep, a clothier was beating out his merchandise with a cat of nine tails. Beyond the town, the land became more rugged. The road narrowed and kept the coach to a trot. Wide open plowlands darkened the terrain. Long streamers of crows flapped heavily behind the teams of oxen who were carrying on with the work. The coach drove past some horsemen whose mounts were free of baggage. Some of them were heading into the open sea of the fields. Others were climbing at a walking pace up dirt tracks towards hills covered in dark-hued woods from which a fine mist, like tobacco smoke, was streaming. The air was brisk but golden. From every farm along the way, the coach scared up flocks of geese. They tried to take flight and winnowed the lower limbs of the sycamores, furiously flapping their bent back wings. The willows hadn't been pruned yet. They were still lifting their branches like trailing red harp strings. Through the deeper hued branches, you saw the pallor of the sky. There must have been a melody inside those trees, though you couldn't hear it because the wheels were rumbling, the springs were squealing, and the shoes of the four horses were clattering on the road. But when the coach passed right alongside a long barn where they were threshing barley, at the same time, you could clearly hear the whole building whistling, Alexandra, please. All of England was whistling, Alexandra, please. From each crossroads, lanes led half a mile to village squares shaded by huge, almost leafless beech trees. You could see dog carts pulled up in the squares and a few men standing around, hands in their pockets, the butcher's boy in his blue apron, pigs squealing, and as though fixed motionless on a carousel, the whole scene swerved all around, all of a piece, in time with the four horses straining on the shaft. After the beaches came long lines of poplars, which also swerved around backward. Then low-slung, thatched cottages with little arch-topped windows that looked out from under the furry brims of their black straw hats. Next came beech groves with the snouts of houses appearing here and there among the branches. Next, a long white wall overtopped by crosses and an oak and a second oak 
and behind the two oaks a church began, not to rise up, but to fall away, its stone cross having been the first thing visible among the twisted branches of the oaks. Next, its compact belfry with its zinc louvers. Next, its roof. Then its stained glass rose. Next, its door, wide enough for cartloads of virtuous offerings. Next, its four broad steps. They touched the ground just as the mail passed by the cemetery gate. <clears throat> the village offered its houses up to view. Women, shaking their aprons to shoo the cats away, were herding geese into their pens. Behind shop fronts and through windows, there was the shoemaker tapping his nails, the tailor squatting like a dwarf on top of his table, the embroiderer bent over her pattern, the minister's fat charwoman with her cross dangling on her pillowy bosom. Oh, Alexander, please, ask your heart if there's not a little something there for me. At his forge, wide open and full of sparks, as though he were fanning fiery kernels of wheat with wind from hell, the blacksmith. The postillion and the coachman saluted him in unison with a shrill whistle. He, in return, struck four or five hammer blows on the clear ringing horn of his anvil. And now, the bridge over the stream. Grab hold of the handrail because there, you see, before you know it, you traverse the hump and get to taste your dinner all over again. <laughs> Then back out to the countryside with the high, dark furrows of the plowlands swerving away in silence, surrounding the moving coach. Next, some young women in skirts caked with mud, returning home heavy-footed through some fields of beets. They stop to look at the coach. Their weary arms droop from their narrow shoulders. Finally, much later, next to a somber field, in a wide open space with no abode in sight, nobody, nothing else around, a haggard little boy, all on his own, warming himself in front of a big blaze of brushwood. That's, uh, <laughs> that was uh, pretty challenging, I must say. I was <laughs> Great job, great job. Thank you, Thank you so much. I, I have a question for Paul. Um, I see a lot of images that reoccur throughout, you know, the beech trees, the geese. Uh, but one of the problems that I had, and I have, you know, my text is marked, and I would say, I don't see what Giono is seeing. I couldn't, there are things that I could not picture or imagine. And so that was hard for me to translate those things that I could not grasp what it was, no matter how hard I tried. And then I'm like, okay, well, I'll just translate what he says. Uh, <laughs> but did you have, ever have trouble seeing what he was seeing? I mean, in the nature, in the imagery with the, I have a lot of clouds and mist and fog and things in, in my book, but there are moments where I can't see the mountains. I can't, I can't understand, even though I went to look at the paysage to get an idea. So did you find that or? Well, yes, I did. And I think the way I addressed that um, deficit, in a, in a sense, was to go and spend time in, in Haute yeah. Provence. Yeah. And indeed, um, you know, Debbie and I made a few trips uh, when I was doing Colleen, um, trying to identify settings. I mean, Giono uh, amalgamated mm -hmm. different settings. But, you know, the vegetation particularly and the topography and all of that, you know, by spending time there, I found that, yes, I was b able better to visualize to yeah. that. And, yeah. and I think that um, uh, living in the country, country as, as we do uh, also um, provided me with, with cer certain images that I could, could draw on. Yeah. Um, but then again... I'm not claiming that I could understand it all by any means, uh, because Jono's imagination was so uh, vivid, so fertile, um, and often I think he was, uh, especially in his earlier writings, um, he was he was um, channeling imagery that he was taking from Virgil and Homer yeah. and Whitman, and I, like as we mentioned earlier. So sometimes those things are a little. You know, hard to a, locate. A little vague in a the little vague, a vague but, for the yeah, no, for yeah, sure. Okay. But, you know, something that struck me as you were reading and, and delighted me 
because it's been quite a while since I read Un Roi Sans Divertissement, and in the meanwhile, I'm um, having worked on Colleen and, and Melville, you know, how Giono, that, that of course, like any great writer, he had recurring images right. that he would, you know, just, you know, rotate and, and modify in, in certain ways, but they're, they, get, they get richer and richer with repetition, and you've rendered them so beautifully, so I was hearing them again, <laughs> you know, it was really lovely. And, and, and yours too. It's, it's, no, it, it's great. I mean, it's really great. <laughs> um, just maybe uh, we, before, um, you know, I open the floor to, uh, to you guys, if you want to ask questions, uh, maybe we should uh, take a look at a short passage of Colline. Uh, in, uh, maybe I sh should read it in French and then... Uh, I'll and read the bad translation. <laughs> <laughs> and so we can compare... Yeah. Yes. Well, the, the notion here is that um, uh, Colleen was uh, translated, as I mentioned earlier, in 1929 by Jacques Leclerc, the Frenchman, published in New York. And um, so what we've done is taken a short passage from the French, and Emmanuel is going to read that. And, and then Allison is going to read, if, she's, <laughs> if it's possible, it's to read <laughs> the, 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 the Jacques Leclerc rendition of the passage. And then I will read my rendition of the same passage. And you're allowed to laugh. <laughs> at, at this one, not at Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and not at you, know. At so you. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, le crapaud qui a fait sa maison dans le sol est sorti. Il a des mains d'homme et des yeux d'homme. C'est un homme qui a été puni. Il a fait sa maison dans le sol avec des feuilles et de la boue. Son ventre est plein de chenilles, et c'est un homme. Il mange des chenilles, mais c'est un homme, il n'y a qu'à regarder ses mains. Il les passe sur son ventre, ses petites mains, pour se tâter. « C'est bien moi, c'est bien moi », qu'il se demande dans sa jugeote, et il pleure quand il est bien sûr que c'est lui. Je l'ai vu pleurer. Ses yeux sont pareils à des grains de maïs, et à mesure que ses larmes coulent, il fait de la musique avec sa bouche. Un jour, je me suis dit, « Jamais, qui sait ce qu'il a fait comme ça pour avoir été puni et qu'on lui ait laissé seulement de ses mains et ses yeux ?» C'est des choses que le seul m'aurait dites si j'avais su parler comme lui. J'ai essayé, rien à faire. Il est sourd comme un pot. Nous deux, avec le crapaud, ça est bien allé jusqu'à la Saint-Michel. Il venait au bord des herbes pour me regarder. Je lui disais, « Oh, collègue, et alors, quoi de neuf ?» Quand j'arrosais, il me suivait. Une fois, c'était la nuit, je l'ai entendu venir. Il se traînait dans la boue et il faisait clou, clou avec sa bouche pour faire venir les vers. Ils sont venus en dansant du ventre et du dos. Il y avait un gros comme un boudin blanc tout pomponné de poils. Un autre qui semblait un mal de doigts. Le crapaud a mis ses pattes sur mes pieds. Ses petites mains froides sur mes pieds. J'aime pas ça. Il en avait pris l'habitude, le gaillard. Chaque fois que j'arrivais, j'avais beau me méfier, il posait toujours sa petite patte froide sur mes pieds nus. À la fin, j'en ai eu assez. Je l'ai eu juste au sortir de sa maison. Il cloucloutait doucement, il tenait un verre noir et le mangeait. Il avait du sang sur les dents, du sang plein sa bouche et ses yeux de maïs pleuraient. Je me dis, Jeannet, c'est pas de la nourriture de chrétien ça, tu feras bonne œuvre. Et je l'ai partagé d'un coup de bêche. Il fouillait la terre avec ses mains. Il mordait la terre avec ses dents rouges de sang. Il est resté là avec sa bouche pleine de terre et des larmes dans ses yeux de maïs. Je vois Jeannet devenir Jade ici pour une raison. C'est vraiment bizarre. Yeah, so I guess he made it because he didn't want it to be confused with Janet, so he changed it to Jade, right? I mean, She's interesting. Terrible. Okay, I'm not quite sure what accent I'm supposed to take with this, but I will give it a try. The toad who made his home in the willow tree come hopping out. His hands are the hands of a man, and his eyes a man's eyes too. He's a man. This is his punishment. He built, he built his house in the willow out of leaves and mud. His belly's full of caterpillars, and he's a man. I, a man, eats caterpillars, he does, by the belly full. But he's a man. You've but to look at his hands. Mark and rub those little white hands of his over his belly to feel of himself. It's me, I, uh, it's me, surely, he says to himself right smartly, and he sets to weeping when he's certain sure it's himself. I've seen him weeping. His eyes are grains of corn, and fast as his ears flow, he makes music with his mouth. Sounds like Monty Python. 
I'm not doing this on purpose. <laughs> One day I asked myself, Jade, who knows what thing he'll have done to be punished like that with only the hands and eyes of and left for himself. Them are things the willow tree might have told me, happened I could speak its language. And I tried, I, I tried, but there weren't enough not to be done. Willow tree's deaf as a post. Well, between the two of us, Toad and myself, things went smooth until Michaelmas. It used to, used to come to the edge of the grasses to look at me. I'd say to him, hello, hello, mate, what's new today? <laughs> when I watered the ground, he'd follow me every step I took. Once at night it war, I heard him coming toward me. He were dragging himself over the mud and going clue, clue, clue with his mouth to draw the worms. Along they come, dancing with their backs and their bellies they war. There were one of them as fat as a white sausage, all tricked out with soft hair. There were another one looked like a sick finger. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what a sick finger looks like, but okay. <laughs> Toad put his hands on my feet. I didn't like his small, clammy hands on my feet. The brute had taken the habit of doing that. Happened I come anywhere near him to watch out for him was labor spent. He always managed to set his small, clammy hands on my naked feet. By and by, I had a belly full. I wished him just he were leaving his home. He were cluck, 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 softly, whooshed. Holding a black worm you are and eating off it. There were blood on his teeth and his mouth all over blood and his eyes of corn dripping tears. So I said to myself, Jade, that's no good Christian blood, you may believe, and it's a good deed ye be doing if. So I severed him with my spade. He was scraping the earth with his hands and biting the earth with the blood red teeth of him. There he stayed with his mouth full of earth and his eyes of corn dripping tears. It's kind of lovely, actually. <laughs> In its own way. In its own way. I think we could put this on stage and get a real <laughs> laugh out of it. <gasps> okay, Paul. Let's case. let's try and no, get, I mean, wipe the smirks you know, off our was, face. This was hailed as a work of genius in, in English in 1929. I mean, well, people's tastes were different. It it's is interesting. Really interesting. It is, but of course, um, I hope when I read mine that it will... <laughs> bear out the sense that it, 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 things do eventually need to be re, redone. <laughs> so, there were little curls of smoke. Oh, no, sorry. Starting at the wrong place. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Wait, it doesn't say that. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, I started at the wrong it spot. Really sorry. Different. <laughs> Here we go. The toad that lived in the willow has come out. It has the hands and eyes of a man a man who's been punished. It made its home in the willow, out of leaves and mud. Its belly is full of caterpillars, but it's still a man. It eats caterpillars, but it's a man. You only have to look at its hands. It runs its little hands over its belly to check itself out. Is it really me? It's asking itself, is it really me? It has good reason to ask, and then it cries when it's certain it really is him. I've seen it crying. Its eyes are like kernels of corn, and the more it cries, the more music it croaks through its mouth. One day I asked myself, Jeanne, who has any idea what he did to be punished like that, to be left with only his hands and his eyes? These are things that the willow would have told me if I knew how to talk its language. I tried, but there was nothing doing. It was as deaf as a fence post. The two of us, the toad and me, once we went all the way to Saint Michel, it hopped along the bank to watch me. I used to say, hey, brother, so what's new? <laughs> when I was watering the meadow, it had follow me around. Once at night, I heard it coming. It was crawling through the mud, going glug, glug with its mouth to get the worms to come out. And so they came along, dancing on their bellies and their backs. One of them was as thick as a blood sausage, all covered in hairs. Another one looked like a diseased finger. <laughs> The toad put its paws on my feet, its little clammy hands on my feet. I hate that. Then it made a habit out of it, the little prancer. Every time it came along, I had to be on the lookout. It had always put its clammy little paws onto my, onto my bare feet. The, the time came when I'd had it up to here. The thought hit me just as I was leaving the house. The toad was croaking, kind of a low croaking sound. It had a black worm and it was eating it. It had blood on its teeth and its mouth was full of blood and it was crying out of its corn kernel eyes. I said to myself, 
Jeanne, that food's not fit for Christians. You'll be doing a good deed. And I swung my spade at it and lopped it in two. It clawed at the ground with his hands. It was chewing at the ground with its bloody teeth. It lay there with its mouth full of dirt and tears in its corn kernel eyes. So I have a question for you, uh, Paul, before um, uh, other people ask you questions. Me too. <laughs> uh, did, you, uh, did you actually read the, uh, the original translation before you translate it, or after, or hmm. during? Okay. <laughs> I th I'm very happy you asked me this, um, because it was a revelation to me. Um, I didn't discover that there had been an earlier translation until I'd gotten a fair ways into my own. Um, and then I thought, well, I better check this out. I mean, at least I better have a, a, a glance at it. Um, I, I, it's a collector's item because it had gone out of print decades ago. But I found a copy at our um, central public library in Toronto, and I photocopied the whole thing. <laughs> there was no restriction on that. I brought it home, and I, and I made a vow, and I, and I held to the vow, which was, I'm not going to look at this unless and when I reach a complete impasse. That can happen. <laughs> and, and it did happen about five or six times in the course of doing Colleen. And I would beat my head against the wall before I'd give up. Sometimes taking, you know, days. I'm sure, Alison, you, you can attest years, to this. Years, years. <laughs> you know, one word or phrase. But I, I kept to my vow. But each and every time I went to that 1929 version to look for that word or, pa or phrase, he had simply left, left it, it out. out. Yep. <laughs> Without exception. And, and it was a funny thing, because on the one hand, it was almost like an affirmation. Right. Like, I wasn't so stupid, you know, that I couldn't figure this out. And he was it, French. And he was French. <laughs> but it also opened my eyes to the fact that when we read, trans, um, you know, published work in translation, we really are putting our faith in the publisher yeah. and the translator. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, I don't think many publishers... I, I don't think many publishers um, are... I mean, how, how can a publisher the editor working for the publisher actually take the time to go word for word against the original. It's just not possible. So, you know, um, uh, you know just uh, as they say, caveat um, lector. 